Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Harold Baker, and we are pleased to have you join us today. Uh, I serve as Deputy Director for the Summer Health Professions Education Program, better known as SHPEP, or SHPEP for short. And so it's my pleasure to begin uh, this session for you. So recently, a groundbreaking Supreme Court decision has significantly limited, if not outright prohibited, the use of affirmative action in college admissions. In a 6-3 vote along ideological and political lines, conservative justices determined that Harvard College and the University of North Carolina violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution which prohibits racial discrimination by government agencies. This landmark ruling has raised numerous questions among pre-health advisors and students regarding its implications for health professions admissions. Our upcoming sessions aim to address these concerns and provide attendees with valuable guidance on navigating the evolving landscape of health professions admissions post this Supreme Court decision. Building on the insights shared in our first diversity session, where common misconceptions within the admissions community were dispelled, these sessions are designed to equip you with the knowledge needed to successfully navigate potential changes to the admissions process and remain focused on achieving your objectives. Whether you are a student who dreams of matriculating to health professions school or a pre-health advisor who wants to ensure you have the knowledge necessary to guide all of your advisees in the successful pursuit of their dreams. Both audiences will receive very useful information from our very esteemed panelists. Now, I turn it over to my colleague, Kim Bellamy, to introduce those panelists. Thank you, Harold, both for providing context for this session today, uh, but also giving me the opportunity to introduce uh, two of my colleagues uh, that I work with through the Action Collaborative for Black Men in Medicine. So our first panelist for today is Dr. Alden Landry, who serves as the Director of Health Equity Education at Harvard Medical School. He is also the Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine uh, Physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and Assistant Dean of the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. Our second panelist and speaker today is Director of Multi the Multicultural Resource Center, Associate Director of the Masters of Biomedical Science Program in, at, at Duke University School of Medicine. And I definitely look forward to speaking with both of them today for our session. Prior to me inviting them to share a little bit about how the DISCO decision has impacted their work within medical school admissions, um, I want to share a little bit about AMC's response to the SCOTUS decision. Um, and I also invite each of the attendees today to visit our AMC webpage, Diversity in Medical School Admissions, uh, so that you can review some of the information that Harold share, shared earlier, uh, but also get a more in-depth understanding around the origin of the case, uh, the, the actual decision that was made, and AMC resources for each um, entity uh, within the medical school admissions community, including pre-health advisors, faculty members, our future doctors, parents, and all other interested and invested parties. Uh, we will be dropping the link to that particular web page in the chat for you to reference later. So again, uh, we wanted to share a little bit about AAMC's response to the SCOTUS decision uh, to ensure that you don't uh, feel like you have to navigate all of this on your own. I know there's probably many questions that came up for you um, since this ruling, and AMC has made sure that we have empowered our medical school uh, community with the tools they need uh, in order to make informed decisions around this. The first 
thing that I want to emphasize is AMC defines diversity broadly to cover all, aspect, all aspects of human differences. Uh, each of you know that we don't come to any space with just one part of our identity. Um, so AMC um, also defines diversity um, to cover all those intersectionalities, including but not limited to social economic status, race, ethnicity, language, nationality, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, geography, disability, and age. The second thing that AMC emphasized to our members and all of the learners who are on this medical school journey is that diversity enriches the educational experiences of health professionals, uh, not only just the learners, but for our faculty members in their teaching experiences as well. And as a result, by having more, uh, more learners who have that in-depth understanding of this, they are more prepared to provide culturally responsive care, leading to improved health for everyone. And then lastly, AMC remains committed to strengthening the diversity of medical student body and the physician workforce. One of the key ways in which we are showing our commitment to this is by creating or continuing to use race neutral practices and tools such as holistic review. You may have heard of this term before, but I want to provide you more of a, more of an understanding around what this means. Holistic review refers to mission aligned emissions or selection processes that take into consideration applicants' experiences, attributes, and academic metrics, as well as a that as well as the value that applicant would contribute to learning, practice, and teaching. Holistic review allows admissions committees to consider the whole applicant rather than disproportionately focusing on one singular factor. So now I would like to open up the discussion uh, for my colleagues here to share a little bit about the implications of how the SCOTUS decision has impacted them within their roles. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Landry and Ms. Collins. So to start off the discussion, I want to ask you, how has admission practices changed since the SCOTUS decision? Well, I'll start. For us, it hasn't made that big of a change on how we make our decisions uh, in the admissions committee. We have uh, used holistic admissions now for over a decade. And what we had to do was to blind the information that the admissions committee received from the AAMC to the markers that you just outlined uh, that would be in violation of the uh, SSFA Supreme Court uh, ruling. So for us, um, we find that we are doing, I think, far more careful reads of the applications because we are looking for the characteristics that as you have noted, our mission aligned and our mission remains having a diverse uh, student body as well as contributing to the diversity of the provider workforce. So for us, we have um, been trained in the do's and the don'ts so that we are in compliance, but we have not moved from our mission. And uh, what we have done essentially is changed the way we present candidates and gone into much deeper reads of the application, the letters of recommendation, the essays, and uh, any other information, including the transcript that the student has cared to share in the application. Uh, yes, thank you for this um, start to the discussion. And I think it's really important to understand that, um, you know, we as institutions um, have been working towards holistic review uh, well before the decision was made by the Supreme Court. Uh, so this is not a new uh, thought process for many of the medical schools uh, that students are going to be applying to. And I would say that um, as both an applicant to medical school and then someone who's been on faculty uh, at medical school, uh, our evaluation of applicants goes beyond uh, race, ethnicity, and gender identity. 
uh, and many other variables uh, are included in the process that we use as part of our assessment of uh, potential applicants. I will say this, I am not on the admissions committee for the institution that I work at, so I can't speak directly to what is happening at the admissions uh, committee right now as they are doing their work in accepting students. Uh, but I am involved in other selection processes for other programs uh, and uh, residency programs and other uh, fellowship opportunities uh, throughout the Harvard ecosystem. Um, I will echo uh, the points that Maureen just mentioned in that we are blinded to uh, the race um, and ethnicity of our applicants, um, but we do take advantage of the entire applicant uh, application that students are presenting to us to help us have the best understanding of who's applying to our institution and why they would be the better applicant for our institution, understanding that we are looking at numerous factors uh, that impact uh, the community that we're trying to bring in, uh, whether it be the student body, the resident body, uh, or uh, the uh, fellows that we bring in um, to our programs, because we're looking to bring together a, uh, uh, a cohort of individuals that bring different perspectives and different experiences to our institution to make our institution better. If I might add that one of the great benefits of holistic uh, admissions prior to this decision was that it forced us to look at the entire application versus just looking at academic metrics, which excluded large swaths of the uh, applicant pool. So um, holistic admissions benefits us on a number of fronts. And uh, I think with practice in this new environment, we will find that it still uh, advantages all comers into the medical school to have an application that is appropriately reviewed for all aspects of what the student brings into the School of Medicine. And before you go to our your next question, uh, Kim, I just want to just double down on that point that, you know, historically, there were institutions that were solely focused on numbers um, and um, to the point where um, these were screen in and screen out tools without truly understanding what an individual could bring to an institution who may or may not have a number, whether it be an MCAT score or a GPA or whatever it is that they were screening for um, to receive an interview and ultimately acceptance into an institution. And I think that was that was a disservice to the applicants and to the individuals that come into an institution. We have to recognize that not all individuals come from the same uh, educational background and have the same distance traveled, have the same lived experience when it comes to their uh, interactions uh, with uh, learning environments. Uh, we also have to understand that not everybody is starting off and ending up at the same point. Uh, and we also have to understand that an MCAT, you know, we were just doing the MCAT session earlier today. There was a question of, well, you know, what if I fail the MCAT? And I think the better way to rephrase that is you don't fail the MCAT. The MCAT is a exam that you take a uh, that, that you take and it provides a score but there's not a failing or passing score associated with an MCAT there's a score that a medical school may want to see as part of who they admit to medical school versus who they don't but you don't fail the exam and we have to change the mindset of what these numbers represent as opposed to uh, making sure that students have to uh, students recognize that they are more than just numbers when it comes to applying uh, to medical school. Thank you both for uh, starting us off strong with emphasizing that this is not a, a new practice that has been put in place, but this is something that has been long standing uh, within. Uh, some of the, the resources and the ways that you've evaluated candidates. Uh, one of the things that uh, you just mentioned, Dr. Landry, was that 
students or learners who apply are, are much more than the number. Um, and uh, Ms. Collins, you mentioned that you're, you're looking deeper into the application to identify some of those characteristics that are above the, the academic metrics. So can each of you share a little bit more about what are some of those key characteristics uh, that students should be highlighting and what are those key things that you're looking for as you're um, evaluating who you might bring into your medical school class? So I operate in the world of bad analogies. And so hopefully I will share this analogy and it works. Uh, if it doesn't just completely disregard everything I say and listen to Maureen because she'll give a better explanation. But the way I attribute or the way I describe the application to process to medical school is that when I'm talking with students, uh, pre-medical students, I explain to them, there's no right application to medical school. You have pieces to a puzzle. You have your community service, you have your leadership, um, you have your student organizations, you have your summer experiences, you have your researching uh, opportunities, but you also have your personal statement and your letter of recommendation. You have your um, GPA and your MCAT. Your job is to take all of those pieces that you've been accumulating over the years and to take those puzzle pieces and put them together and put together the best picture you can, understanding that there may be a hole or understand that it may not be exactly what you would expect an application to medical school to look like, but you put together the best pieces that you have and you present that to the admissions committee. And their job is to decide, is this the picture of an application uh, of an applicant we want to accept as they look at the entirety of their application pool, as they look at the class that they want to bring together, and as they look at what the mission and vision of the institution is and how it relates to the patients uh, that those um, physicians that they're creating are ultimately going to, going to serve. So what comes into that are all the things that I just said. Um, have you been involved in student organizations or have you been involved in um, health work, whether it be policy work, health equity work? Have you been involved in volunteer work? Have you done your physician shadowing? Have you participated in research? Um, not everybody participates in research and it's okay. Not everybody has to have research as part of their application. Again, you are putting together the puzzle pieces that you have and presenting that to the admissions committee. You take all of those pieces and you present them together. Um, not every applicant is gonna have the exact same application. Not every applicant is gonna have the same number of community hour, community service hours nor will they have the same number of research hours or publications or presentations. We as an admissions committee must take what you present to us and decide, is this enough? Is this what we are hoping for? Is this what we would expect out of someone entering into our medical school? And more importantly, is this someone that we can train to become a healthcare professional that will exemplify what our institution wants to produce? I will add to that, that the MCAS application is your story. And each part of that application provides context for how you have performed, how you have achieved, um, if you come from modest beginnings, if you are privileged in any way, it tells us what you have done with that privilege. And the subtext of that entire application is why medicine. So what that application tells us is your journey from whatever inspired you to decide that medicine was your path or avocation to the door of the medical school. So if you would take the opportunity to think of all of the things that provide context and shed light on you and your experiences and bring those into your personal statement, your answers to secondary questions and how you capture what you have learned from or gained from those experiences, you'll have an application that makes you attractive, I would imagine to most schools because we'll then be able to say, well, here's a student who worked 20 hours a week, or who was a varsity athlete. And for those reasons, we understand that this student might not present a 4.0 GPA. 
here's a student who comes from uh, a privileged background who did not have to work, but look at the service endeavors that this student contributes. Look at the compassion demonstrated in this application. We'll be able to look at a modest MCAT score and say this student came from here, there, the other, and bring context to the entirety of that application. This is what the, the holistic review is for. It's not picking out one thing, is having you have the opportunity to tell your story and to bring context to the traditional metrics that schools often look at. I remind students often that medical school is school. It's not an apprenticeship. It's not an opportunity for you to run around the hospital. It's not a casting call for ER. It, it entails spending time with faculty, learning the things that undergird the practice of clinical medicine, and presenting to an admissions committee those things that say, you can do this. There are no perfect applicants. There is no perfect application. But there are applications that don't leave the question, why medicine, unanswered. There are applications where your list of recommenders have been carefully curated and can, who, and can answer questions about you and your application that save you from using up your valuable 5,000 characters or 335 characters uh, to make that explanation. The whole thing together is your story and its context for what you have done in school so that we know you can do school when you get here. Well, both of you provided uh, very valuable strategies uh, in terms of making sure that our applicants are emphasizing and making that, that connection and alignment between the school's vision and mission, uh, as well as making sure they're addressing why they want to pursue the field of medicine. One of the aspects of what you just stated in terms of why medicine that I want to dig a little bit deeper on is the SCOTUS decision didn't say that students can't address race, ethnicity at all within their application materials, as long as it has a connection to their lived experiences. So I wanted to ask both of you, how would you suggest a student uh, address this within maybe their personal statement or other parts of their application? Uh, or how would a pre-health advisor or another educator that is helping a student prepare their application materials help them determine the best way to address this in a way in which the admissions committees can, can appropriately receive that? I'll start. <laughs> the spaces... Um where we actually have the opportunity to make use of information like that is certainly in the personal statement and in the answers to the secondary prompts. The um, SCOTUS decision said that we can take into consideration the impact that race, ethnicity, socioeconomic uh, status, et cetera, have impacted the student. So um, it can show up for us in the personal statement, in the statement on socioeconomic disadvantage, uh, in a number of the uh, uh, secondary questions, a lot of schools now have questions that say, tell us who you are. And it's an opportunity to talk about those attributes and the immutable attributes, such as race and ethnicity, and how those have inspired you to uh, consider uh, education around disparities in health outcomes, how they have inspired you to want to return to a particular community, how they have inspired you to look for a diverse set of, of uh, colleagues in the School of Medicine and faculty because of what you know about the benefit to that, to education overall and to your career path. So what it requires is that you consider carefully who you are and what your influences have been and what the impacts have been on you, your community, and your journey uh, to uh, a medical school. 
And I, I can't remember, you know, in our prep conversations, how we were sort of thinking about discussing this topic. And uh, because I want to really emphasize the fact that when we have these conversations and we're talking about the SCOTUS decision, we're talking about the use of race and the decision to uh, uh, accept someone to medical school and how uh, we aren't supposed to be talking about race and then we're not supposed to be using that as a factor and we're not we're, we're going to be blinded to these topics um though these this is th these these are legal questions these are legal issues that institutions are trying to prepare themselves so that they are operating within the confines of the law um so there's expectations on the institutions there's also um the opportunity for you as an individual to tell your story and i think we have to really focus in on the story as to the why the person is applying to medical school and who they are. So who you are and why you are applying to medical school. And there are a number of spaces and places within your application, whether it be the experiences that you use to indicate uh, or your activities within the application, your personal statement, or even as uh, Maureen mentioned, how you cultivate the letter writers uh, of who you are gonna be asking to write those letters of recommendation for you to help share your story, because they are also going to be providing voice and insight as to who you are as an applicant to medical school. But we also have to be cautious in saying that you have to expose your yourself in a way that makes you uncomfortable and a way that makes you feel as if you are sharing pieces of your, your life or your story as you share your distance traveled uh, that can be traumatic to you. And so it's really important for you to think about what content do you think is necessary and valuable for people to have the best understanding of who you are uh, and why you're pursuing a career in medicine uh, without presenting yourself in a position where you're going to be uncomfortable with having a further discussion about this? Because one of the things that we often tell students is if you put it in your application, it's an opportunity for a question or a conversation in your interview. And if you put it in your application, are you willing to share more about that story um, and, you know, so you have to be aware of what you're putting in your application. You don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to share the traumatic issues that have led to, you know, struggles in your life. Um, but you do need to be honest and you need to be upfront and you need to be, um, able to express your, your, your passion about pursuing your career in the health professions. And that goes beyond your race and that goes beyond, uh, your socioeconomic status that goes beyond um, uh, other aspects of your lived experience that may be negative. There are positives to being a Black person who is interested in pursuing a career in the health professions. There are positives to being someone who is a uh, uh, sexual gender minority who wants to pursue careers in the health professions. There are positives to being uh, uh, a Latinx or Latin and prefer pursuing a career in the health professions. And so you can share those positive experiences as well as a part of your story. And so I think it's really important for us to stress that to the applicants, share your story but share who you are in the form that you feel comfortable with exposing yourself to these admissions committees, knowing that you're probably going to have these conversations as a part of your um, interview process for medical school as well. That is absolutely excellent information. Uh, what I, I got from that is that you all as applicants have agency in what you share. So you can make that decision about how much you share, what you share, uh, but also being prepared to address that at other stages of the application process. So whatever you put in that personal statement, what you communicate to your letter writers um, or on any of the, the secondary applications that, that those topics may come back up again and, and build, being uh, in a space that you're ready to communicate and rehash some of that again, uh, whether that is something that is more, um, more of a traumatic experience, or, or as Dr. Landry said, you could definitely absolutely emphasize something that is uh, more positive as well. One uh, thing before we get into our uh, uh, last question, I wanted to ask, what are some uh, resources that you would direct students to to, to really uh, guide them through the process of their application? Is there any either A and C resources or other um, 
other tools that you know of that would really help them build a strong application and make sure that um, as they're trying to make sure their story is being communicated in a way that's in alignment with the institution uh, that they can refer back to, to those things. So I'll start off with a couple of shameless plugs. One is uh, my organization, the Tour for Diversity in Medicine. We've cultivated a lot of material that's out there uh, to help students uh, as they are in the process of making that transition from pre-med student to applicant and ultimately matriculant to medical school. Uh, and so you can reach out to the Tour for Diversity in Medicine. Um, I think there's other organizations that are out there like ours. Uh, there's the relationships that for the students who are participating in this conversation that you've cultivated uh, as part of your SHPEP experience and the team of individuals that you are around uh, that you can reach out to. But I think at this point, it's also really important for you to have those strong relationships with your pre-health advisors and hopefully the pre-health advisors that are listening into this webinar as well. Um, they understand that this is a two-way street and you need to be working closely with these students um, to help build that application uh, in a way that's going to be, um, um, you know, the application that the um, uh, admissions committee is excited to read as opposed to uh, uh, tripping over as they're trying to figure out who to, uh, to, who to offer interviews or not. So having those strong relationships with pre-health advisors are really important. Uh, there's other organizations out there uh, that are nonprofit organizations. Uh, there's other extensions that you can reach out to within your institution. Uh, but really having those relationships uh, are going to be important to uh, putting together the best application for yourself. I've also been impressed with what the student uh, medical associations have done in terms of mentoring pre-health students. So SNMA has been excellent with this resources and referring students. LMSA has, APAMSA and others have done a really fine job. The uh, first gen student organizations will host a national conference this year and they will address these issues as well to uh, help students uh, tell their stories and to guide them through the process. Who you don't want to talk to is your pediatrician, your orthopedist, or anybody who's been out of medical school forever because they have no clue what's going on in admissions. And I would like to reiterate the importance of working closely with uh, a pre-health advisor. I know it's difficult because in many schools, the pre-health advisors don't really talk to you until you're a junior, but I'm willing to bet if you're persistent, they can refer you if in their space, um, because of resources, they don't have the time to um, to uh, devote to you. We see the first gen sophomore students uh, here in the School of Medicine because we have that same traditional uh, sort of setup where the the pre health advisor might not uh, have the time, and we also have someone in our um, our pre major our academic advisement center who will spend time with pre health students. But our students can come right up here to this very door and we will chat with them about um, how to prepare that application, uh, how to make decisions about what schools to apply to and uh, that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of legwork for you to do because there are plenty of resources. Uh, and in this digital age, there's no excuse for you not accessing a great many of those. Um you mentioned SNMA and LMSA, phenomenal organizations. Uh, another organization building the next generation of academic positions. Yeah, thank you. Phenomenal organization um, that works with students. Um, tons of opportunities that are out there. And as Maureen said, just do your do your homework. There's uh, lots of uh, lots of places and resources and to to out there to support you. Sorry. I realized now that I did not even introduce myself <laughs> when we started this session. So I'm gonna take a brief moment to do that uh, just because it also has, a, a, my role has a related connection to some of the organizations that you mentioned. So uh, hello everyone, my name is Kim Bellamy. I work within our equity, diversity, and inclusion department here at AANC. Um, I serve as lead strategic programs and partnerships as some of the partnerships that I uh, feel very blessed and privileged to, um, to nurture and build are those with organizations such as SNMA, 
I'm going to pause there because I realize everyone might not be familiar with what uh, some of the acronyms mean. So SNMA is our Student National Medical Association, LMSA, Latino Medical Student Association. Uh, I believe there was mention of our first gen low income in medicine uh, organization, which is one of the newer uh, medical student led organizations. Um, that has that specific focus of uh, helping support those that might be first in their family to become physicians or maybe first in their family uh, to actually uh, enter and complete college. Uh, but these are all excellent, excellent organizations to uh, to connect with. Each of them has a, um, a arm of their organization that works with pre-medical students as well as medical students. So uh, you all, if you're at the undergraduate level or even prior to that, if we have any high school students joining us, uh, you do have an opportunity to connect with those organizations for sure. And they have excellent resources uh, to help prepare you for those next steps. And uh, one of the, or a couple of the AMC resources that I also want to mention as it relates to making sure you're preparing your, your application and stating your why uh, in a, a way that uh, really tells your story is uh, the core competencies for entering medical students. This is something that's been developed by AAMC, um, as well as some of our partners within academic medicine community. Uh, and it really gives you a guide of emphasizing how some of your experiences, whether it be in the classroom or outside of the classroom, will translate into a health professions career. Um, so an example of that might be critical thinking. Uh, I know each of you exercise that um, in various different ways within your classroom experiences. So um, ensuring that you're finding those, those related connections there. Communication, you all do that uh, in, in various different ways, whether it be actually uh, connecting with your, your peers in a discussion board, doing a class presentation, or communication could mean you uh, being able to navigate being an entrepreneur and starting something on a social media platform. So thinking of all those creative ways that you can uh, definitely um, emphasize some of those, those core competencies. Uh, we also have something called the anatomy of an applicant uh, that helps you map some of those core competencies to how some of our medical students who have been some of the do the same things as you in terms of applying and, and working with uh, pre-health advisors, how they talked about each one of those competencies within, the, within their application. And the last thing that I'll address, which I um, fully agree with, is making sure you make those connections with pre-health advisors. They're such a vital part um, to you learning more about the process and your experience. And we do recognize that not all uh, students or institutions have a pre-health advisor um, available. So uh, the National Association of Advisors for the Health Professions also has a resource that will help you uh, match uh, with a pre-health advisor if you do not have one available at your institution. This leads me uh, to a, a question that I thought of as you all were talking. Uh, how might a pre-health advisor build a relationship with a, a medical school, like how is that relationship nurtured and what are some of the um, some of the key tips that you would provide um, someone in the pre-health advising space to, to help a student prepare for that next step? Well, for our institution, the Office of Recruitment and Multicultural Affairs reaches out to engage with uh, pre-health advisors to offer um, conversations, talk about the medical school, talk about the student experience. Um, and we would love to reach out to additional uh, pre-health advisors to share the experience um, and share what it's like to be at Harvard Medical School. And so we have a whole team of individuals who do that type of work. So I think it's really important for the, if there's a pre-health advisor who's interested in having someone come, especially in the world that we live in now with Zoom, uh, where communication is so much easier, uh, and, you know, we don't have to worry about travel costs and can do so from the comforts of our offices. You know, we can have a 30, 45 minute discussion about what the institution offers, what it, uh, ex what we expect of the students who are applying and accepting uh, what the student experience is while they're here. And ultimately what happens to students when they finish with medical school and where they go to residency. So those opportunities are available. It's just really 
a matter of finding the right time and the right opportunity for uh, us to meet. Um, we also would like to engage student organizations. So if there's a, a MAP chapter or minority association of pre-health students or other student organizations on campus uh, that are looking for individuals to come and speak, uh, we have individuals who have done so. Uh, we also work with our medical students because the student chapters of those organizations that Marie mentioned, SNMA, LMSA, um, they often reach out to uh, and and have these conversations uh, on behalf of the medical school and can give insight as to um, uh, the application process to medical school. But from a student perspective, which is much different than when you hear it from uh, someone in Marine and I's position, uh, you know, uh, on the administrative side of things. And and I agree. Um, I don't care what you do. I've been advising pre health students for decades. And I know that a student will get a message across uh, sooner than I will. But I hope the advisors know that they can just call us. You know, we'll answer the questions. We will show up and uh, are, are very happy to do that. There are four allopathic medical schools in North Carolina and one osteopathic school. And we have sort of informally divided up the state so that we can hit the MAPS chapters and have them advised by our SNMA chapters you know, all across the state. And we worked, we meet uh, together as a group once or twice a year to talk about pathway programs to make sure we're reaching as many of the, uh, of the students where there might not even be formal pre-health advising and making ourselves available to support those students as well. Before we open it up for Q&A, uh, and this is also shameless plug for those of you who are tuned in to drop your questions in the Q&A uh, so you can have all of the things that uh, maybe we didn't address during the dis discussion addressed during this time. So uh, please head that way now. Uh, but for, before we head into that portion, um, I um, Definitely be remiss if I didn't bring up this aspect of the discussion. So all of the information you all provided has been very encouraging and it lets uh, everyone that is in this space know that in terms of medical schools that, um, you know, diversity is still um, important and that uh, the student is being evaluated and on a holistic perspective and uh, they are being able to, to share their why in a way in which uh, those uh, different committees will be able to get the full uh, depth of um, who they are and what's gotten them to this point. While that is true, we also may have seen that a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts have been struck down or it's not as much support there within the last year. Um, for those of, of us within the audience who may have some concerns about how that might translate into the medical school space, what type of guidance would you provide them? So I think, you know, and this may not directly answer your question, uh, but hopefully um, I, I can bring enough context to this discussion. Uh, that it gets to the direction that you want it to go. Um, we're, we're having these discussions around um, diversity and we're basing this a, a lot on race, but I think there's so much more to this discussion than, um, than, than race that needs to be addressed. And really the ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve here is health equity and making sure that patients because this is what it's about, right? Medicine is not about the career. It is about the individuals that we serve, that we care for. And so the ultimate goal in this is to make sure that when a patient walks into, well, for me, it'd be the emergency department or for others, it would be the labor and delivery unit or the OR if you're a surgeon or into the clinic if you're a PCP. Wherever that patient walks into, they receive the best care from the individual sitting across from them who is that healthcare provider. So we have to make sure that we have that in focus on what are the outcomes for our patients? How are we improving their health? How are we making sure that we're focusing on health equity? 
So when we have these discussions about, well, what's happening at the medical school, what's happening at the residency level, the work does not stop. We still need to continue to engage our learners to make sure that they have the skills, the knowledge, the attitudes, and the behaviors in order to address the patient's needs in order for them to achieve optimal health. We have to continue to engage communities that have been disenfranchised um, from our healthcare system. We have to continue to engage communities that uh, distrust the healthcare system because of years of neglect or abuse. We have to engage the students who are interested in pursuing careers in the health professions so that they can come into joining this uh, community of healthcare providers, become doctors, become dentists, become other healthcare professionals so that they can go and serve the communities that they're from or bring different perspectives, thoughts, and experiences into the spaces in academia that have often been very uniform or homogenous and therefore don't have a lot of diverse thoughts or ideas. And so ultimately our goal is still the same, to increase diversity within the healthcare professions because we know that in the end, it's gonna improve the health outcomes of the patients that we're trying to serve. So all of that, I think is the answer to that question. But I'd like to sum it up this way. When we think about what health professions, education institutions can do to address the needs of our population. The most obvious is to graduate a diverse group of folks who will practice in a nation of diverse peoples who will be patients. That is what we can do. We have the evidence that patient-physician concordance is important. We have the evidence that cultural humility and cultural competence across the provider population is important to health outcomes. These are the things that health professions educations can contribute to knocking back these health disparities. And so that said, we have that obligation. We have to do the best we can with holistic admissions. We have to ask our applicants to provide the context for, for their application by telling us who they are and how it has created um, this application and their desire to answer the calling to medicine. So I would say, uh, Kimberly, that the answer is this is what we can do. This is where we enter the question of how we address these issues and improve them for the nation's health. Because people forget that if you pull the people of color out, if you pull the poor people out, we look pretty bad as a nation in terms of our health outcomes. It's not that the populations of people of color um, or the poor in the nation are dragging our health statistics. That's not the case. So we need to do what we can do as a set of institutions in a nation that really has fairly poor health considering what we spend per capita on health in this nation. So I hope that um, what we've heard from, from Dr. Landry and, and anyone else you may listen to about that is that this, this thing about holistic commissions, this thing's about, about diversifying our population provider, um, the provider pool is what we can do. And it be, in addition to providing good care, it is, the, it is the best thing that we can do for this nation. Uh, Kim, this is Harold. I just wanted to uh, make a quick observation, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I've heard uh, from our esteemed uh, panelists over and over again, the importance of sharing your story loudly and proudly and boldly. And I just have to say that as I look at the screen and uh, our uh, esteemed panelists, uh, Ms. Collins has a, a picture of the National Museum of African American History and Culture behind her. And it's like, that says to me how important it is to tell your story. 
because in that building is our story. And so throughout this conversation, that's what I've been thinking about. And so I hope that our uh, audience understands that the entire uh, medical school application process is that uh, applicant telling their story loudly and proudly and strongly. And it was just really uh, uh, amazing to me to see that image and to, to connect it with the message that we're trying to deliver uh, to those applicants. So definitely tell your story loudly and proudly and, and put it in uh, up front and, and center like the National Museum of African American History and Culture is right next to the Washington Monument. And I feel that that's very uh, intentional and on purpose and it sends a message. So hopefully everyone will hear that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that, Hero. Thank you, um, Ms. Cullens and Dr. Landry, for your responses. Uh, so we are going to move into Q and A. Um, I have a couple questions that came from the audience. Uh, the first being, MSART really overwhelms me, as the majority of schools are are very uniform about stats and students they select. Does MSAR capture, does MSAR close a capture of matriculated students or are there other information not shared? So, you know, I was looking at this question. I was trying to figure out how to best answer this. And what I will say is this, you are often seeing averages that are listed as far as average GPA, average MCAT, average age. Please understand that these are averages and the way averages work because we are all individuals who've taken some advanced math is that we take all the numbers, we put them together and we divide them by the total number of um, you know, responses. So these, there are some people who have an, a, a, a GPA that's higher than whatever is listed. And there are some people that have a GPA that's lower because that's how you get to the average or somewhere in, in the middle. The same with the MCAT. So please don't get discouraged by the numbers that you see because these are averages for these institutions on where the students lie. And you may have other components of your application that make you stand out and make you a valuable applicant to an institution aside from those numbers, again, the GPA and the MCAT that uh, unfortunately we tend to get focused on, which is not holistic review. If you're doing holistic review, you are looking at everything not just the GPA and the MCAT. And I'll add that some of the pressures that schools have felt to have high average MCATs, high average uh, GPAs, I think is being lessened by this move away from the reporting to US News and World Report. Uh, we no longer report and so we have a much wider range of acceptable scores to our School of Medicine uh, that our committee will talk about in a way that I didn't hear. And I've been on that admissions committee for 20 years now and been part of training the committee and, you know, but, um, but now it is, it is the case that we are much more comfortable considering a much wider range of, of, um, of MCAT scores. Uh, I would say that we still have a soft threshold for GPA because I remind you again that the only way we know how you do school is how you have done school. And that is why you need to, to be careful to provide context for what we get to see in your application. Okay. Our next question uh, refers to, or references a, a earlier statement within our discussion around um, the, the process for evaluating applicants and, and blinding um, information within that admissions process. Um, so this attendee wanted to know uh, what specifically is blinded uh, during the, the review of applicants? Is it just race, ethnicity? Is gender included? Um, if either of you could provide a few more details regarding that.
So for us, um, I think what's notable is uh, race, ethnicity, um, uh, sexual orientation um, is no longer captured. Gender continues to be captured uh, in our application. Uh, socioeconomic uh, status continues to be captured in our application. Geographic information continues to be captured in our application and is forwarded to the committee. And the majority of that information stays uh, blinded until the application process is closed and students have been accepted. So um, it's 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 a longitudinal process that this information is blinded. It's not just during the initial phase of the application process. Our next question uh, is regarding the personal statement, uh, which we um, had much emphasis and discussion on today. Uh, this particular attendee said they are currently in the process of writing their personal statement and struggling a little bit to tell their story and wanted to know how much is too much when, when trying to fully explain their why. I think this is really a personal discussion and a personal decision. What I would encourage someone to do is to work with people that know them well, and then also people who don't know them well, and you know present the versions of the personal story, statement that they have. Um, and if you're willing to give this statement to a complete stranger, which is essentially what you're doing um, when you are submitting your application to medical school, if you're willing to give it to them to read it and then ask you questions about it, um, then, you know, that's a good starting point. But I think you also need to go and talk to people that know you quite well, because you may be only telling a part of your story. And it could be that, you know, a parent or a guardian or an older sibling or an aunt or uncle can help to round out the story and say, and, you know, back when you were, you know, 12, you were engaged in science projects and you started talking about wanting to be a doctor because of, you know, what happened to a family member or, then they can help to help you tease out that story and help you to shape out that best reason, that best way of you presenting yourself in the form of your personal statement. Um, again, you have to be comfortable with what you put in that application because it is a possible discussion point during your interview. And if you have put something in there that you don't feel comfortable sharing with others and discussing, then it probably shouldn't be there in the first place. But if there are things that are important to you that help shape your identity, that explain why you wanted to go into medicine and then what you will do while you're in medicine uh, should you be afforded the opportunity to become a doctor and how you will use the knowledge and the opportunity and the platform that comes along with being a physician uh, to, um, you know, whether it be advanced medicine, be a leader in medicine, to care for a community, to do something in medicine that you think is valuable and important. That's what needs to go in that personal statement. And I would add again that that personal statement is one of the ways you bring context to your application. And I'll remind you that no one gets admitted to medical school on a sad story. So if you can't take whatever this information is and demonstrate how it has shaped you, how it has propelled you, how it demonstrates your resilience and um, all of those characteristics that we look for, that we believe indicate that you will be a good provider and indeed a healer, then that's not a story for you to tell. So I do think that all the people that Dr. Landry has suggested that you help you, help you shape this thing uh, are important for you to try to get at least two or three people to read that and help make sure it's appropriate. Excellent. So we have come to the close of our discussion for today. Um, I would love to uh, have you all join me in thanking uh, Dr. Landry, Ms. Cullens, um, as well as the director of SHVP, uh, Dr. Harold Baker, for joining us today. Um, I'll just leave you all with the, the final words that I was thinking of as we uh, went over that last question. Um, you as an applicant, there, there's some things that are out of your control in terms of, um, you know, what the, uh, the 
Supreme Court decided or, you know, the level of support at institutions, but what you can control is the narrative that you provide and you showing your commitment to health equity and making sure that you're able to provide that culturally responsive care um, to the communities uh, in which we serve. So I am going to uh, turn it over to Harold uh, just to provide a few closing words and then allow you all to transition for today. Thanks, Kim. And uh, again, uh, special thanks to our uh, panelists for doing an amazing job. And thank you, everyone, for being here. We hope that uh, this session was uh, very helpful. And to those uh, students out there who aspire to uh, attend health profession school, uh, dreams do come true. Just keep working hard and take care, everyone. <laughs>